Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us at this exciting event. Um, my name is Rachel Schmidke. I'm the advocate for Latin America for Refugees International. And today we'll be discussing how Mexico and the US can work together to uphold the rights and meet the needs of Haitians. Um, before we begin, I just want to flag a couple housekeeping points. So the event will be hosted in English to start off with, and then for the panelist discussion, we will switch to Spanish. Um, we'll have simultaneous interpretation in English and Spanish. And if you would like a transcript of the event in Haitian Creole, please get in touch with us and we can get that to you. Um, if you need translation, please click the little globe icon on your screen to access the channel. And for those of you who are fortunate enough to be bilingual in English and Spanish, don't worry about the globe icon, you can just stay on this um, main channel. An audience Q&A is going to follow, so if you want to pose any questions to our speakers, please use the Q&A function in the chat. You can post that in Spanish or English and I will simultaneously translate that. Um, now I would love to introduce uh, Refugees International President Eric Schwartz for a few opening remarks. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Rachel. And it, it is my pleasure uh, to welcome you all to this important discussion of the experiences of, of, of Haitian migrants in Mexico and at the U.S. border. I want to thank in advance our panelists, and I also want to thank my colleagues, uh, Rachel Schmidke and uh, and our senior advocate for uh, U.S. policy, uh, Yael Shocker. Uh, the experiences of Haitians uh, in the Americas reveals a failure of countries to uphold their obligations and to share the responsibility to effectively protect people seeking refuge. We just came back from a trip to the border where we saw what it means for Haitians in northern Mexico. People we met in Reynosa lacked housing, access to medical care, uh, lacked school for their children, work opportunities. Uh, Title 42 of the Public Health Act has also made potential refoulement to Haiti forced return, a reality for so many Haitians who cross the border. This event will spotlight the experiences of Haitians and uh, include a discussion of ways to increase their access to protection and to dignified life in Mexico and in the United States. Solutions involve changes in the work of local organizations, the Haitian community, in the policies of governments of Mexico and the United States and their agencies, and by international organizations. So with that, uh, let me, uh, with great pleasure, uh, turn to um, Yael Shocker. Yael? Thanks so much, Eric, uh, and thanks to everybody for participating in this panel uh, and for coming to this event. Uh, my name is Yael Shacher, um, and many of us are familiar with what happened in Del Rio, Texas last September. Uh, the efforts by the U.S. Border Patrol uh, to push uh, Haitians seeking asylum back into the Rio Grande. Uh, the guarded encampment that confined Haitian families under awful conditions near the International Bridge, and the summary expulsion on removal flights of Haitians in shackles to Haiti, um, a country that was reeling from political and humanitarian crisis. Uh, as Rachel and I discuss in a report we released about a month ago, um, pushed into the shadows, uh, expulsions to Haiti under Title 42 ramped up again in December of 2021 and January of 2022. Indeed, they have ramped up again this past week, uh, even as the policy was supposed to come to an end and screenings introduced to assure families are not returned to peril of persecution. Seven flights carrying hundreds of Haitian men, women, and children were sent to Haiti on Tuesday and yesterday. More Haitians have been expelled by plane than people of any other nationality under Title 42. This is not fair, it's not right, and it's not necessary. The Biden administration has wrongfully expelled the same number of Haitians, about 25,000, as Ukrainians as it has rightfully paroled in at the border. While Title 42 has garnered immense attention, there has been less recounting of how the policy has been experienced and what has happened to expelled Haitians once they're back in Haiti. We had originally attended for the clip that we're about to play to be a video, but this past weekend, the man featured in it was sought out and threatened by gang members in Haiti, a testament to the deteriorating security situation there. 
So we have shifted to an audio clip, which we're gonna play right now. Okay, it looks like we're having a little bit of trouble with the clip. So um, I'm going to continue my remarks. And if we can get it online, um, that would be great. Um, we can play it towards the end. Um, um, Refugees International first met the man um, in the clip. And I, and I should just say, um, you know, what the clip was about was about um, a man who described being transferred to different DHS facilities um, at the US-Mexico border, uh, receiving poor food and treatment there before being expelled to Haiti. Um, and once arriving in Haiti, an inability to leave his house essentially for fear of kidnapping and an ability to support his family, which he found um, just mortifying. Um, Refugees International first met the man in the clip um, in Tapachula in Mexico. Um, the push and the, the push into the shadows in the title of our report doesn't only refer to mistreatment at the US Mexico border and expulsion to Haiti. Uh, it is a reference to the way that a lack of access to asylum and the threat of expulsion at the US-Mexico border combined with Mexican policies that transferred Haitian migrants without concern for their needs and rights elsewhere in the country leaves Haitians in perilous and precarious limbo um, in northern Mexico. In the fall of 2021, um, besides what happened at Del Rio, uh, there were thousands of Haitians and asylum seekers in Southern Mexico. There they had difficulty applying for and gaining asylum or other immigration documents. Um, they were forced to stay in Tapachula uh, where they um, were turned away from hospitals for needed care. There was a lack of organizational support really available to them. The Mexican immigration authority rounded up Haitians and sent them to a detention center. The Mexican National Guard uh, violently prevented groups of Haitians and other asylum seekers from moving northward. In the wake of protests by Haitians and calls for reform by human rights groups, the Mexican Immigration Authority initiated a transfer policy that drew thousands of Haitians to a Tapachula stadium, where they waited in miserable, miserable conditions for buses to take them to 17 places in central Mexico. Once there, continuing their asylum cases and finding work proved difficult, so many traveled further north to cities like Ciudad Juarez and Reynosa. Refugees International, as Eric said, visited Reynosa early this month. Haitian families and other asylum seekers had just been moved out of an encampment by the National Guard and police and lacked shelter and needed medical care. So many who we met in Reynosa were still suffering unaddressed ailments and trauma from the trek through the Darien Gap. And there were also new traumas. A Haitian woman told Refugees International of having been raped while looking for housing for her family there. A Haitian man, man said armed men in Reynosa threatened him and demanded that he begin to work for them. Most of the Haitians we met were eager to seek asylum in the United States where they had relatives, but Title 42 has kept the port closed for them and they are feel, fear, fearful of expulsion to Haiti if they try to cross the border. Um, we have, I think we have access to the first clip now, so maybe we'll play that and then immediately following it, we will play the second clip that we were, the second video that we we're going to play now of a man named Eddie who we met in Reynosa. So if we could play the clips sort of back to back, that would be marvelous. Thank you. Bonsoir, Rachel. Comment are you? Ça fait longtemps que je oui? Je me félicite de ce que vous avez fait avant moi, parce que vous toujours fait interview avec moi et je m'apprécie tout dans ce sens où parler. Bon, et pour me commencer, là, je suis arrivé au Mexique. Je suis fait un petit temps au Mexique. Je suis arrivé au Mexique, je suis arrivé à Tijuana. Je suis arrivé à Tijuana. Je quitté le Mali Mexicali à Baja California. Après, je fait comme combien de semaines 
moi je vais cacher un travail, je vais faire un café, je vais faire un corps pour me payer un café. Je suis obligé à le fermer. Mais je me suis le fermer, c'est une façon pour moi aussi de me libérer. Pour me dire que je la vie mieux en tant États-Unis parce que moi, c'est la majorité de gens qui sont capables de faire un travail, pour faire de l'école, pour apprendre. Je suis bon, obligé de faire ça. Je suis arrivé dans la prison hein, et je suis passé la première prison. Hein. Je suis bon, ça a été comme manger, on va créer les tortillas avec un jus, avec un pain, un moins orange, un bon moins pomme. Et ça a été bon moins manger. Je me fait 8 jours prison, je me fait 8 jours à manger. Je me suis manger ça. Et ce n'est pas ton manger tout, je suis tellement habitué. Je ne pas te faire bien. Et nous sommes dedans. Et pour moi-même, le traitement n'est pas tellement remède, je ne suis pas traité bien. Parce que je ne pas un monde qui est contre la prison, qui est contre tout le jour, qui est contre la prison. Mais, de pour nous, la police ou bien nous, mais l'immigration, ça a tout fait, c'est le pour faire, ça a bon manger. C'est le plus beau. Et il faut accepter. Parce qu'on va se compter tout. Donc, moi, je suis obligé de rester dans la prison. Parce que je suis dans la prison. Pour me dire que je suis fait mal, je suis un docteur. Je suis dit que je pense que je pense trop. Je suis venu faire deuxième, je fait mal. Bon. Et après, je suis venu passer comme dans quatre prisons comme ça. Quatrième prison, il y a eu le vide dans deux heures du matin. Il y a eu le vide Bon, pour moi, il y a eu le vide dans le vide difficile. Pour moi-même. Parce que, bon, pour bien dire, il y a eu le petit de me l'école. Ça fait deux semaines. Je ne vais pas l'école là encore parce que je ne vais pas l'école pour me payer l'école là. Je ne vais pas l'école pour me payer l'école là. Je ne vais pas travail. Je veux dire, vraiment, il y a une petite pour moi dans ce moment-là. Et tandis que chaque jour, je m'appelle, je dis que je suis venu, je ne suis pas là, je suis malgré. Je ne pas tellement fâché avec moi, mais ce n'est pas dans le bon sens. Moi. Pour moi, je suis venu de côté, je ne suis pas au cop. Et pour que je vais retourner à l'école, pour moi, je ne suis pas venu à l'école. Et tout le monde qui va à l'école. Et bah, il y a eu une petite pour moi. Vraiment, je ne suis pas bon sens. Je viens de penser, et si tu fais kidnapper toi, tu ne peux pas faire ça, plus de problèmes. Parce que je pense que tout le monde ne peut pas faire ça, tu ne peux pas faire ça. Et je ne sais pas qui façon je vais faire ça. Pour moi, pour me décapable de là. Et puis, je ne sais pas si je vais faire ça. Je ne parce que chaque monde ça a payé 100 000 dollars. Imaginez, pour moi-même, je n'ai pas un goût. C'est un bar qui est vraiment terrible pour moi. Bon. Et je suis vraiment félicité. Et je vais juste transitionner à la prochaine vidéo, qui sera une vidéo actuelle avec un homme nommé Eddie que nous avons rencontré à Reynosa. Hola, muy buenas tardes. ¿Cómo estás? ¿Todo bien? Gracias a Dios. Sí, no, yo salí de Haití por el motivo me, que mi salida de Haití, mi salida de Haití, Haití, eh, tengo un problema, tengo un problema en Haití hace mucho y se mató mi hermano y mató mi papá, entonces los bandidos lo, estaban atrás de mí para matarme. Yo tuve que salir urgente de Haití y... Ese problema fue que yo salí de Haití, en Haití está muy, 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 muy mucha, mucha delincuencia, secuestra mucho, y como secuestrar e intentar violar a mi señora, y nosotros tuvo que salir huyendo también de Haití. Ese es el motivo que yo dejé en Haití, y muchos problemas, como mata a mi papá y mata a mi hermano, entonces yo tuve que salir atrás, porque a mí me cae atrás también para matarme que yo pensaba que yo iba, iba a pelear con ellos, también iba a matarlos también. 
por eso me, me, me caí atrás para matarme. Entonces yo salí de, de, de Haití, cogió aquí en México, aquí en México, y llegando aquí está súper triste, súper difícil la cosa, y lo trabajo es muy difícil, y casa, para conseguir una casita es muy, es muy, cuesta mucho, cuesta mucho y también es muy difícil para conseguir al llegar mucho inmigrante está súper complicado la cosa entonces por eso es que estamos esperando que conseguí una nueva oportunidad y pidiendo a Dios que no me regresen en Haití porque en Haití yo no puedo regresar más la otra vez estuve en Haití tuvo que salir huyendo de, de, con mi familia no puede ir en la casa en mi casa donde vivía no puedo ir y tuvo que salirme a la República Dominicana urgente porque no, puede, no podía quedarme en mi país. Y estoy pidiendo a Dios que, que no me deje volver más en, en Haití porque está súper complicado, súper complicado. Y, y la niña a veces está pensando y llorando que, que, no quiere volver, que no quiere volver en Haití por lo que ha pasado y mi esposa también que a veces se puso a llorar y se ha complicado la cosa, las situaciones ha pensado tanto que no quiere volver en Haití And I, I, I just want to say, you know, uh, as Eddie indicates in the clip, uh, you may have heard that he said that he immediately had to flee Haiti and he went to the Dominican Republic. Um, most of the Haitians that we interviewed had been um, in several different countries uh, in the Americas. And uh, as Eddie indicates in our report details, um, the violation of Haitian human rights and the refusal to provide Haitians with dignified refuge is a sort of hemispheric failure. Um, the Haitians that we interviewed fled targeted violence in Haiti, as you heard described, um, and were then compelled or felt compelled to move from the Dominican Republic, Brazil, Chile and Mexico because of violence and discrimination, a lack of secure legal status and access to dignified work and basic social services, an inability to unite with family members. Um, and at work, you know, there's this upcoming summit of the Americas that's going to happen in June. And it's really incumbent on countries in the region, including the United States, to commit to providing legal pathways and access to protection to Haitian immigrants. Last thing I'll say before we turn it over to the panelists, um, the method that we used in our report was repeating interviews with Haitian migrants to try to understand their changing plans and intentions and how policies were impacting their experiences in different places and the kinds of reforms that could be made to ensure their rights are upheld and needs better met. I'll now turn to Rachel, who will discuss this further with our distinguished panelists. So thank you. Thank you so much, Yael. Okay, so now I'm going to switch over to Spanish for this next portion of the event. So for those of you who are listening to the Spanish channel, please exit the channel and you can listen to the event as is. And if you need to hear the event in English and you would like interpretation, go ahead and click the interpretation icon now and join that Spanish channel. Voy a explicar lo que dije en, en español ahora, entonces voy a, estoy cambiando ahora la porción del evento en español. Si necesitan, eh, si están, estaban escuchando el evento en español, pueden salir del canal de español de traducción y pueden escuchar el evento como es. Entonces, eh, sí, ok. Ahora quiero dar la bienvenida a los tres panelistas que tenemos hoy día. Eh, quiero introducir primero a José Perreros, representante asistente de protección para el ACNUR México, Jesse Balsín, la coordinadora de trabajo con la comunidad haitiana para espacio migrante, y Wesley Luke, coordinador de la Asociación Refugiados Haitianos en Tapachula. Bienvenidos a todos y gracias por estar aquí con nosotros. Eh, voy a empezar con unas rondas de preguntas y luego vamos a abrir la discusión para preguntas de la audiencia. Entonces, José, voy a empezar contigo. Eh, 
con más de mil, eh, 100 mil solicitudes de asilo el año pasado, México se está convirtiendo. México is turning into more and more into an, asy an asylum uh, country for a lot of nationalities, including Haitian folks. I would like to know what kind of options uh, as far as protection are available for Haitian folks in Mexico and what are the advantages or disadvantages of these options? Thank you. Good afternoon uh, and greetings to to Wesley and to Jesse and to say th uh, thank you to Refuge International for this super important report and for uplifting the situation for Haitian folks in the route uh, through Mexico and the United States. I think it's very important and urgent uh, to deal with the challenges uh, publicly, to publicly talk about the challenges uh, that the Haitian population and the access to the rights that they are entitled to. To respond, uh, Unfortunately, the only option that we have in Mexico is asylum. And it's via uh, notice as a refugee. There are no other alternative forms for that are accessible migratory options. In Mexico, we've had an, an increase in since 2015 of, of, of requests for asylum. To give you a quick no, uh, number, in 2017, we had 7,000 people that had not, were not born in Mexico. In 2021, 130,000 looking for asylum. In 2018, 30,000, and it, it, quadrupled in, it quadrupled in 2021. And during this period of time, the budget continued being the, is the same. In 2021, the increase uh, is pronounced at more than 50%. The 70,000 folks that asked for asylum were uh, nationals of Haiti. And then with a percentage of them that were Brazilian, with children with Brazil that were, had, were Brazilian or Chilean because they were born in those countries. So it's true that the dominant nationalities that are seeking asylum in Mexico, Honduras, Haiti, Cuba, Salvador, Guatemala, Salvador, all of these, a high percentage can require protection as refugees. The issue is that uh, Comar, uh, the 2017 to 2021, it's the same budget. And clearly there is not enough capacity at Comar to process in a timely manner the folks that are seeking asylum in Mexico. So, so what is required? The first, uh, knowing such the high percentage that are requiring this, uh, this, this refugee status. So trying to mitigate uh, through Comar, the financing is not enough. So the first thing required is increase the capacity for Comar in order to process, process in a timely manner. There's such high number of folks that are seeking asylum in Mexico. And that includes more personnel, more capacity, and interpreters. A lot of offices, we don't have Creole interpreters and Haitian folks, or Haitian people from Haiti can, can tell their story. They can't say things in their language. And this is obviously going to affect their ability to access these protections. Secondly, knowing that some of the people that I've mentioned, like there are different protections such as like refugees, um, Comar, uh, unfortunately, we have a very low number of folks that maybe are not seeking asylum and it's been declined. And then there are alternative uh, migratory options for these cases. There are some agencies we recommended clearly and directly in September that we do not return Haitian folks to Haiti. And unfortunately, there are no other ways of uh, migratory access for this population. Um, and, uh, for example, there's the visitor uh, card for humanitarian reasons. There could be other ways, but up until date, this hasn't happened. What this creates is that the only option for them is via Comar. And 
And a lot of folks don't go to Comar because they've suffered at the hand of that. The waits are forever. The waiting is waiting months in Tapachula. And this is a very unfortunate. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of a lot of them are not known or recognized as refugees. If there were an alternative of uh, migratory um, protection, they could be a faster, more accessible channel for these folks, and also um, would would ease some of the stuff, some of the 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 load for Comar. What we want to do is to be able to create different ways for Comar to be able to process these uh, applications and then create some type of alternatives of migratory regulation. Thank you, Jose, for painting that panorama of the protection situation for people from Haiti. Now, Wesley, I want to know, Tapachula still is one of the most impoverished uh, zones in Mexico has the greatest number of people seeking protection. In 2021, we saw the arrival of many Haitian folks come to the city and a lot of them have moved within the same year. You've worked a lot in Tapachula and you lived there for about a year now. In your experience, what has been what have been the primary needs of Haitians in Tapachula for 2022? And how have uh, how's the community, the Haitian community organized to fight so that the government, uh, fight for the government um, takes care of those needs? Thank you very much. Good afternoon to everyone. The to the panelists and to the folks that are connecting via uh, social media, social social networks. That's a good question. Maybe not for me. My name is Wesley Luke. I'm Haitian. Having the opportunity and privilege of working very closely with uh, the principal actors, the main actors that wanted to find a solution to this problem, their daily that are daily affecting the migrants, the Haitian migrants in Tapachula. The challenge, the biggest challenge, but the biggest challenge in that we're facing the Haitian migrant community is the Pachula. For example, the, the language barrier, for example, and then also the integration of the Haitian community here in Mexico. So, for example, it, to have access to things, for example, for, uh, most of all, for access to health, access to education, access to school for children, because like you mentioned, uh, I've been there a year in Tapachula, and I've seen a lot of the Haitian children that are there, they can't, uh, they don't have access to, to education. So unfortunately, in Tapachula, uh, medication for pregnant women, um, unfortunately, has caused a death because of the lack of access to medication for the women. And then also because of the language barrier in public offices, our, our compatriots have not been able to, as been mentioned by Jose, to be able to realize or, to, or carry out their transactions with their stat, with their situation because they don't speak Spanish. And also, there are no there are no personnel, uh, bilingual personnel, to be able to give them the due uh, assistance that they're they're entitled to. And what I'm seeing 
as one of the most affected thing is that barrier that that language barrier so i believe that what we're requesting what we're asking for is the integration of us here in in this in this country give us an opportunity primarily access access to work access to to be able to rent a home there are no possibilities uh access to education as i have mentioned already there is none the other thing as uh, an experience that i've had in papachula especially at the national institute of immigration uh, immigration has been taking people that are already in Comar, has been taking people away immigration has been deporting or taking people that are already in the Comar process and a lot of them already have a humanitarian visa in some cases with residency and and they take them to detention centers with the excuse that they're going to check their legal status in the country some of them have been taken to the the gate or to the door to their home to the door of their home and then once there so i had the opportunity to they talk to a person about this for every person that has been detained is remorse in order to be released even though however the norm is very clear the rule is the policy is very clear somebody who's already in coma cannot be detained by the National Institute, nor be returned to their country of origin. Also, in order to check the status, the legal status of an individual, all we need to do is to scan it, scan the document. That's it. They have all the information required for for this to, to, to check on them. So then in order to, to follow what's happening in Tapachula and the time that we've been here, it's just not enough. To me as a, for me as a person, my experience in Tapachula is just something I, I don't think anybody would want to go through because literally a lot of folks are, are hurting in the same way that I've already mentioned, and some have died um, in detention. All of that truly, I think, like I have mentioned, in Tapachula, things are not easy. It's very, very, very uh difficult thank you wesley thank you wesley for your testimony very impactful so now jesse i wanted to ask you um migrant space uh released a survey for ocean folks and their plans during uh with relation to the pandemic in 2020 have you seen changes in the last year and a half for the haitian community in tijuana and how does migrant space uh work with the Haitian community in Tijuana now. Good afternoon to everyone. My name is Valsin Jesse. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you for having me here. Thank you. There's two of us. I am the twin sister of Jessica. So if we look the same or we look very similar so we could be twin sister we could get but yes i am her twin sister 
since I arrived in Tijuana, um, Espacio Migrante uh, started their work in 2015, but their but their major impact was with the Haitian community. What we were doing is connecting research on the rate of discrimination and racism in with the migrant community, especially with the Haitian community. And what we've seen, uh, aside what well, part of, I was, I was conducting the surveys with my sister. So we had to work with those folks that the population that didn't speak a lot of Spanish. Um, you know, they have enough to kind of like uh, get by, but it's not a hundred percent Spanish. One part that always will come up is the discrimination the racism towards the Haitian immigration community, Haitian uh, migrant community. And then the, the, the racial profiling by the police, they get detained. For example, there are a lot of us waiting for a Calafia, a bus or a transportation. And if they see our color, you know, they're asking, they jump on, they ask, you know, checking people like by under this uh, racial profiling also discrimination when it comes to uh, rent a property or renting a home uh, they basically need to go with a mexican person in order to rent a house in tijuana because as a immigrant they have this excuse that they're they're gonna stay the house will not be in a good state because i don't know how many how many people are going to move in we don't want any children or they come they they come to visit the person everything's signed everything's good to go and the signature has to be from the mexican person that is accompanying you to rent the house they they come the the property owner, property owner just come and visit you just keeping eyes on you to see the house, what state it's in, which should not be in it, not be a thing. So it's possible, you know, that after a month they could like kick you out of being there. Another thing with the racism, well, um, the discrimination is when with the, when you try to get your license, they're asked your license for driving. You need to have some type of property here in Tijuana, you have to bring some proof of that. And you also have to do other type of trend, like transactions in order to have your driver's license here in Tijuana, Mexico. So another thing is under this racial profiling and discrimination and racism, I remember it was two weeks in Tapachula. When we returned, I was with my supervisor, my bosses, Paulina Sara and my sister, Jessica. When we got back, uh, we were entering in Tijuana. Well, the migratory agents, the immigration agents let the other ladies pass. And then they said to us, okay, you get out. Uh, who were who you traveling with? Let's see your paperwork. Are they all in, stand in good standing order? Well, it was very strange if everybody else in the group was able to pass, but we were not. And this racial profiling continues in immigration offices or immigration officers. There's a there's like a line. You have to stand in a virtual line to get your appointment to go in in, in none and, and do your transactions. Another thing is that in our work in Espacio Migrante is to deal with language justice. And then another thing that we do is uh, just food justice. Every event we have an interpreter, translators, so a lot of the institutions assume that the Haitian community don't speak Creole, but they speak French. Well, French primarily is more geared towards students. Parents do speak it, but not uh, some folks had to like abandon their education to send their ch kids to, to school. So this is a, a thing that's still in process and children, well, those are the ones that are more apt to speak French. In 2015, a lot of those children were not born in Haiti. They were born in other countries. So when we have uh, an event or we have uh, an activity that we have translators, they say 
well, we have some translators, but they can do it in French. Well, um, the community is not going to understand them. Their first language, their na their mother language, or their native tongue is Haitian Creole. And they have to find people because a lot of them speak Spanish really well. So this is another form where we're looking for the language justice. Another thing is the uh, justice with regard to eating to food. Um, we don't have, we have a, 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 a like a card uh, uh, with money on it for Calimax, a grocery store. So they can buy products related to what they eat in their culture that are part of their diet. So some of those parts and the Haitian food. And then there's also the disinformation with Title 42. In the Haitian community, they're barely starting to understand what is Title 42. And a lot of them have been deported without knowing that, well, the they they were not uh, deported they were just returned to it to haiti and then they don't really uh, they don't really understand under what under what premise i was sent back to my country and then also in haiti is a country that has two things that like are causing us to leave and to immigrate to other countries the first one is the political status of haiti is not not stable it's not well a lot of gangs in the country we cannot live and secondly these natural causes which has been the hurricanes uh, earthquakes that have driven us to immigrate so to emigrate so and then there's poverty because there are a lot of folks didn't have work before and less when they return to their country so another form to help settle folks when we're here, help folks to settle in, is through translation again uh, with Haitian interpreters. But in immigration, uh, they don't have uh, access to interpreters. And then there are offices as well that mm, give services to the migrant community, but they have to pay for them and it's super expensive and well, and they're in the process of asylum, they could, they could deny their case and, you know, because of this. So there's just not enough way of sending money to the country and that's all my part. Thank you. Thank you, Jesse. I see that we have about 16 more minutes for this event, so I had two questions, uh, very, short, very short questions for Jose, for Wesley and Jesse, and then we're gonna move to the questions in the chat. Jose, I'd like to know, I'd like for you to talk a little bit about the program. And he, for Wesley and Jesse, I would like <clears throat> if you could talk a little bit about how the international community can help highlight and talk about the voices of the immigrant, uh, of, of the Haitian folks, for the Haitian community. So we had a program of in Mexico, refugees in Mexico. We've currently just gone through 20,000 people that have gone, been benefited from this program. What it basically is, is to relocate refugees from the south of Mexico and Tapachula to cities where there are more options for work and there are more services available. In Tapachula, which takes in about 80% of the folks that require, require a political asylum or asylum in Mexico, these are states with have the least amount of uh, resources in the country where access to services that Wesley was mentioned, and it's very, very limited. So, So relocating them where they have access to, to, to better services and, and more opportunities for work. And so we also wanna explore for folks that are not requesting asylum, but are going through other avenues. Uh, we can possibly include these folks in the program as well. We're starting to right now, I think we need to first look at um, how many people are coming in, how many people are able to find work, 
and check their, their stability in this, how, how quick their, the level of stability. What we were proposing is to be able to show for the folks that require it, there are options with regard to work in Mexico. And uh, through other avenues um, for my immigration, some folks are finding uh, work. They're very like appreciated and, and really valued by Mexican employers, not just Oxo Soriana. I'm sorry to mention uh, commercial brands, but they have given work to migrants and refugees, Haitian migrants and refugees. And basically what we wanted with this proposal is it's uncomfortable the message the folks uh, of the people of Haitian immigrants as them being a problem. They're not a problem. They're the result of a problem that they suffered in Haiti. And there are also opportunities for Haitian folks and for the labor sector, labor force in Mexico. Haitian community can and contribute to the development of Mexico. And I will end with this because of the time, but with that said, uh, asylum or other migratory avenues is one part of the solution because there are a lot of Haitian communities that are, have family members in the United States and they have a legitimate right to try to immigrate to the United States or that for the obstacles that Jesse has already explained very well can make their stay in Mexico very difficult. And then part of the solution has to also be a discussion about access to the United States for those folks that require that protection in that country. Thank you, Jose. Jesse, Wesley, very briefly, if you could respond to the question and then we'll pass to, we'll move on to the chat. Well, basically, um, we want to make sure that the solutions are not like quick fixes. You know, I don't want us, they don't, I don't, we don't want them to give us, you know, handouts. But what they, what we want is show us how to create these goods for ourselves. Give us the means for creating these resources because it's the only way that we will be able to have the necessary change for the good development, for the development uh, and the growth of each individual that needs this support. And then continue creating more awareness and to put aside our personal interests because unfortunately there are some folks within certain organizations that do not want to collaborate among those these uh, situations this hurts folks that need it the most, the most support. So in order to help what we could do is, or what can be done is organize these types of events to strengthen the voices to help migrant folks, migrant communities, especially Haitians that are suffering the most here in Mexico. So continue creating mechanisms for supporting Haitian immigrants, Haitian migrants. Thank you very much. Jesse, if you have something you want to contribute. Well, uh, thank you. Uh, this is part of, uh, well, the community. If we don't speak Spanish, one form for us would be Uh, you know, for folks that are looking for asylum or when we enter into certain shops and businesses that are private or government ones, they do have uh, this thing with the interpretation or translation and when we talk about language justice, not like when we were in Tapachula when they impeded that the Haitian community was not able to sell in the plaza and then and then like they were asked to sell somewhere else, but they were, you know, they finally did get interpretation, but then sometimes when I get information, why am I the last one to know all this information or that I have access to interpretation? So again, 
language justice is very important. There are a lot of us that speak Spanish. There are a lot of us that want to support. So one good way of doing that would be to employ us as migrants to have this information to make it uh, valuable and put it in be able to share it in the native language of the folks that need the services there are a lot of discrimination uh and a lot of businesses um, a lot of discrimination and the forced labor is still happening it's still going on in certain parts that are Tijuana that are doing this or bosses are putting people to to this so one way would be to create more awareness with the population. There are a lot of us that want to stay in Mexico, so it would be a, a, wor a, a dignified way of, of supporting us. And thank you to help us raise the voice. Uh, so we continue doing this work for this community and the Haitian migrant community. Well, we were sometimes the last one, so it would be nice if we could start working together Thank you very much for everything. In the chat, I see two questions. Whoever wants to respond. Uh, the first question is, how can we deal with the issue of racism in the, in, the, in the asylum process and the immigration policy? Who wants to answer that? Well, I would think that it's fundamental, uh, the interpretation part. It's a challenge uh, in Comar that we have because of the lack of resources. And we have uh, the, 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 the challenge with the resource, economic resources to hire interpreters to ensure that information is presented in Creole, that there are Creole interpreters during the asylum processes and uh, immigration processes. We work with Comar. We've been able to work <clears throat> the collaboration with interpreters in the case of Inani. Um, I think it's very important as far as advocacy. And a second point would be to make visible the situation in Haiti. I think there are a lot of like, that there's like confusion about because of, is it because of the poverty or because of the earthquakes, but very few people know about the violence happening in Haiti. I think it's very important to make visible all of the positive stories of folks, uh, Haitian folks in Mexico. Um, the images, of course, are protests, uh, le legitimate in Tapachula, et cetera, but they're not focusing so much on all the positive things that uh, the Haitian community brings to Mexico. You know, Wesley can maybe speak more to uh, that feature the, the positives. All right, Wesley, Jesse, if you'd like to add something. So, well, uh, a lot of years we've modified. Um, so we've been forced in this place of our country of origin to find a place to look for part of the, what we notice in Tapachula, which is these are things dealt more with uh, the protests. We don't talk about a lot of children that want to continue with their studies, but they can't go to school or they put them in the afternoon session where they're not even to get their certificate, uh, where they need to be accompanied by a Mexican national in order to enroll their kids at school. Those things are not seen. Well, the house that they're renting is basically 3,000 pesos, which is basically uh, they're paying 3,000 uh, pesos in the casa. The house is worth less than that, or the, the rent. And then they have to, you know, we don't talk about all the expenditures. We don't talk about the difficulty with that. I think it would be important to start there. Okay. Thank you very much. I think we have time for one more question. Um, I see one that says... Uh, 
in other Mexican communities, we have a community that's organizing. Well, I think Jesse can respond to this. Uh, other Asian communities, like ARHT in Tapachula. Well, another association, another group that so provides uh, support for HVA, Haitian Vision Alliance, HVA. I think the office is in the United States, but then also one in Tapachula, when they were they support by giving uh, help with medications, and then also they. To help them with the, the the basic form that they have to present at the moment of requesting their their visa for humanitarian reasons. So that's one of the things that are in Tapachula, aside from aside from the one mentioned. Or ARHT. Yeah, uh, unfortunately, there are no more. I agree with Jesse. Unfortunately, there are no. no I want to, there are no others. I want to take this opportunity to, to the Haitian Alliance for all the support that they are giving to folks in Tapachula. And what, what Jesse just mentioned, as far as medications. What I like the most that they do, not only for the Haitian community, because I had the opportunity to accompany an African person uh, sleeping at General Hospital, accompanied to be there. Um, thanks, Jesse. Thank you, Jesse. For, for, for truly, thank you, Haitian Bridge, for that work, because there's no more. Okay, well, thank you very much, Giuseppe, Wesley, Jesse. This has been a really enlightening conversation. I'm sorry that we are not able to answer all the questions, but these were very good. And well, have a nice day and uh, thank you very much and have a nice afternoon. Thank you, goodbye.